genetics gets the attention because it's really been in the genetic studies that we have really learned the most about what at a biological level is actually contributing to, um, to social impairments and contributing to uh, getting diagnosis of autism. But it's, it's not a simple etiology. Autism is a complex trait with contributions from a variety of different genetic factors. There's no one gene uh, that can cause autism in an individual. It's always a combination of factors. And because we now have access to whole genome sequencing and we have computational tools that allow us to look at the combinations of factors, that's really been where my lab has been going in the last few years. And so what, the, what I'd like to kind of explain today is really um, our current understanding of how combinations of like rare gene mutations and then uh, more complex common variant risk factors actually contribute to autism. Um, it'll be a little bit data heavy, but I'm pretty good at um, I'm pretty good at uh, making the the data slides make sense. So I promise you, you won't get lost. So when we say that there are many different factors, uh, the genetic factors that contribute to autism come in a variety of forms. So um, the, one is the so-called polygenic risk. This is what we call the genetic background. The many common variants that all that all of us carry and that were inherited from from ancestors from many years ago. And uh, it's really just, it's really a genetic background that that's what defines, when you say, um, you know, the genetics that defines your personality traits, the genetics that defines um, your body mass index and your susceptibility to diabetes and your susceptibility to heart disease, a lot of your basic who you are comes from this polygenic background. And, uh, and, and that's, that's one aspect of the genetics that's one aspect that's contributing to, to, um, to the etiology of autism, but it's not the only thing. When you sequence a genome, you can find a lot of stuff. And so some of the other factors that we're talking about are fairly recent mutations that were really only go back a few generations that carry a, a larger amount of risk than, um, than what the genetic background was carrying. And then on top of that, there are very recent mutations. And you've probably heard a fair amount of about this in the literature and in the media as well, because this is this is actually where most of what our knowledge of, of the causes of autism actually come from these rare mutations that impact genes and carry a large amount of risk. And, and a lot of these are very recent mutations. In other words, they're not actually inherited from mom and dad. They're new mutations that arise in the offspring that weren't in the sperm or the egg. That's actually a big factor, but, but it's not the only factor. And even in an individual who has one of these new mutations, it's not the only factor. So uh, it's, we have to really look at all of the genetics to understand the etiology of autism. There are also mosaic mutations that can occur in the developing brain as well. We know that these are a very small contributor to risk um, and they're harder to get a handle on. So I won't be talking about the mosaic mutations. I'll be talking about the first three. So uh, the rare variants, these de novo mutations that I was telling you about, this is where most of our knowledge of the, of the um, actual molecular basis of autism comes from. There have been over 120 genes identified, and these kind of coalesce into very broad neurodevelopmental pathways. Um, these include the synapse, uh, you know, synaptic proteins that are involved in neurotransmission. That is one of the major categories. But another and major category that's actually more abundant than the synaptic proteins are the genetic switches. So a lot of the factors that really contribute to autism, at least that we know of so far, consist of certain types of genetic switches uh, that play some role in the regulation of neurodevelopment. So, so the genetics is telling us very clearly that how the brain develops and the, the factors that regulate the development of the brain prenatally are big factors um, contributing to autism. Now, the other, some of these other factors, uh, for example, polygenic risk. Uh, this is the genetic background I was talking about. Um, just, a, just a very brief background that I think will be helpful in understanding the rest of the talk, and that is that you can come up with these things called polygenic scores. And um, there's a few different polygenic scores that have been linked to autism. So obviously, the polygenic score for autism is associated with autism, no surprise there. Um, some other polygenic scores that show an association with autism is that 
The polygenic score for schizophrenia also shows an association with autism and autism families, suggesting that there's some common uh, etiology, there's some common biological pathways between autism and schizophrenia. Another really intriguing result, the polygenic score for educational attainment is associated with autism. This was, this was a, a bit of a, of a surprise, but basically, if you, if you calculate the genetic score for educational attainment, make a genetic predictor of whether you're going to stop at high school or college or graduate school, the child with autism on average has the highest polygenic score for educational attainment. In other words, they're, they're genetically predicted to be the most highly educated person in the family. So this, is, this was a really intriguing result, which, uh, which will become relevant later in the talk. And it suggests that there's, there's some biological correlates between the risk factors for autism and the genetic predictors of academic achievement. And this, becomes, this will become relevant later because we actually learn a little bit of useful information from looking at this polygenic score for educational attainment. So the way these polygenic scores are calculated, um, I think Simon showed an example of a, of a genome-wide association study. Uh, again, uh, don't be overwhelmed by these dense data slides because they would overwhelm anyone, including a scientist. This is really just a, this is really just a symbolic image to show you um, all of the different uh, SNPs in the genome that you can link to autism, and then you can also assign them some uh, little effect size. And they all have really small effects. But what you can do now is you can take an individual's genome and you can look for all those little variants in the genome. You can find them all. And then you can actually sum up these many small effects into a final risk score, um, and which we call a polygenic risk score. And so this is a way of taking all of the, the small effects in the DNA, summing them up and coming up with a, an estimate of, of an individual's risk. And when you do this, sure enough, those polygenic scores show association with autism in the population. So it's a, it's a useful tool. And of course, now with our whole genome sequencing, we can look at all of these factors together, the rare mutations, the de novo mutations, and the polygenic scores. And this is, we're doing this in uh, samples that were recruited here in San Diego, including 1,100 individuals from San Diego, as well as combining with data from many other studies to look at a total of 37,000 genomes in this study. Um, now, I won't, I won't get into these dense details. The main point is that we can actually measure each of these factors. So we can measure the de novo mutations, we can measure the inherited risk, and we can measure the polygenic risk and do it, do it well across large numbers of samples. So first off, uh, these, are new, these are new data uh, that were not used to find the, these factors in the, in the first place. So we can actually ask, how, how solid are these genetic associations to begin with? Well, they are very solid. <laughs> All of the factors that we're looking at show con reproducible confirmed associations in our study. The de novo mutations, as you can see here, the green are the rates of these mutations in, in the, um, uh, the, off the offspring that's on the autism spectrum. And the, and the cream colored uh, plots are their typically developing siblings. So when you're comparing a child that meets criteria for autism, to their typical neurotypical siblings, you can see that clearly there's more of these mutations in cases than in the sibling controls. Um, this is also true for inherited risk. So when mom and dad carry a rare variant and are transmitting it to their offspring, you can see that it's transmitted much more frequently to the, to the offspring on the autism spectrum and, and under transmitted to the typical neurotypical siblings. So there's actually less likely to be transmitted to the neurotypical si siblings and more likely to be transmitted to the, to the cases. And the same is true for the polygenic scores. If you, if you actually measure the polygenic score of mom, dad, and child, you can see that the polygenic score for autism is significantly higher in the child than in both parents, meaning that they over-transmitted the polygenic risk. And when you do the same thing with neurotypical siblings, the polygenic score of the neurotypical siblings on average is lower than the polygenic scores of mom and dad. So there's under-transmission of risk to the neurotypical siblings and over transmission of risk in families to the, um, to the cases. So the, the genetic signal here is overwhelming that you can, you can quantify pretty nicely um, these different factors. You can also combine them into nice statistical models that allow you to sort of sum it all up into a genomic risk score, but I won't get, I won't get too, uh, too much into that. Now, there was this question about what is going on with this, 
um, male bias of autism. And why is it? Well, there is a, it, it, it is, I think the, the question of, is there a biological basis to it or is it just misdiagnosis? I think the answer is yes, yes. <laughs> so so there, there's clearly a genetic basis to it, meaning that um, at least, but, it's, but that genetic differences between uh, girls and boys on the autism spectrum is probably driven by the ascertainment bias, right? So you're, so you're only able to pick up autism that's really severe and, and, and more likely to pick up severe cases of autism in girls than in boys. And we can see that in the genetics. So here are the rare variant uh, factors. And you can see that on the left are the, um, are the cases in the families. And the, the female cases have much more rare variant risk than the male cases themselves. And so there's, there's clearly a, uh, we're clearly looking at, at girls who are more genetically loaded than boys. So basically you're, you're capturing, you're seeing that there's more genetic risk in girls than in boys. Um, this is also true for polygenic risk. There's more polygenic risk in girls than in boys. And for polygenic risk, it's actually true for cases and neurotypical siblings. So girls that are neurotypical can also tolerate more genetic risk. So this is, this is quite consistent. Uh, that's what you see here, that the, even, even the neurotypical siblings, girls have a little bit more genetic load than the boys. And this is overall consistent, and this is true for the overall genetic risk score. So this is consistent with um, girls in the population being, this has nothing to do with the X chromosome, by the way, right? This is just girls in the population can tolerate a higher genetic load of, of autism risk. And girls who meet criteria for autism have an even higher genetic load. So this is, again, this is both, there is a genetic difference between girls and boys on the autism spectrum, but that genetic difference probably has to do with the fact that you're only diagnosing the more severe uh, cases and that have higher genetic load. Um, so I won't get too much into this dense data slide, only to say that we can clearly see that there is a genetic spectrum and so this thing we call the autism spectrum is probably to some extent related to a genetic spectrum that we can see. And what, what, I, what I mean by that is that if you have genetic factor A, you're, you're gonna be heavily loaded for A and you're gonna have less of genetic factor B. It's just consistent with some liability threshold. So if you, have, if you have more of one genetic factor, you have less of the other and vice versa. So you see this negative correlation. So girls who have the, the rare mutations um, have less polygenic risk than girls who do not have rare mutations. And that's also true for boys. Uh, boys that carry the rare mutations have less polygenic risk than boys who do not. So this is consistent with uh, there being different etiologies and that, and that there's a different architecture in certain cases than, than others. And so this is really, this is consistent with there being a liability threshold. And that liability threshold, the threshold actually differs by sex where, where, where boys probably have a lower threshold than girls. Um, and that threshold also contributes to there being a spectrum of genetic risk factors. There's this inverse correlation of rare variant risk on the left and common variant risk on the right. So, so there really are different genetic ideologies across this broad spectrum. And if, if those different genetic factors actually have different traits associated with, the, with them, they would explain why the autism uh, spectrum actually has such a broad phenotypic spectrum. So this genetic spectrum may actually be um, a basis for the broad phenotypic spectrum. So uh, again, apologies for the dense data slides, but this is, this, is the, this is the phenotypic spectrum that we're talking about. So we're looking at how all the different genetic factors correlate with repetitive behavior, social communication, adaptive behavior, motor function. And we can look at both the, the, the uh, neurotypical siblings and we can look in the, um, in the cases and we can look at parents. We can look at the, um, the, the uh, the spectrum of phenotypes in the parents as well. And so what you can see here is that different genetic factors actually do have different uh, traits associated with them. So the, um, um, importantly, um, and I'm very, very encouragingly, the autism polygenic score, sure enough, is, so, is associated with social communication and social responsiveness. So this is consistent with, I'm glad to see that the autism polygenic score is picking up uh, social traits. And it's varying in uh, cases particularly. And that's also true for rare variants. So the de novo mutations and the polygenic scores are basically explaining variation in social traits in cases. So that's, that's a good sign. <laughs> uh, but there are a variety of factors and they're not all really having the same effects. 
So the polygenic score for educational attainment, for example, um, is actually really seemed to be driving repetitive behavior in a way that some of the other genetic factors aren't. So that was interesting. We don't know why that is, but, but repetitive behavior seems to be more influenced by this polygenic score for educational attainment. Social behavior more uh, explained by the de novo mutations and the polygenic score for autism. And in the, in the parents, if you look at, the, at panel B on the bottom, you can see um, the factors that are being affected in parents. And you can see that parents are showing traits based on the genetic factors that they carry. So the polygenic score for autism in parents is correlating with social responsiveness scores. And it's correlating with the broad autism phenotype questionnaire in parents. So clearly parents that carry autism risk have subtle um, subclinical traits that, are, that you can see that correlate with the genetic factors that they carry. Um, and um, interestingly, uh, there's also factors that influence parental age, and I'll get to that in a second. Uh, but before, before we get into that, um, gene by sex interaction. So this question of <clears throat> this, this female protective effect. So can we actually see whether the genetic factors are having a different effect in boys versus girls? We can actually look at that in these data and ask the question, so do any of these genetic correlations show that this factor has a different effect in boys versus girls? And the answer to that is generally no, generally not. Most of the genetic factors have very similar effects in boys and girls. So it's not as if, it's not as if um, the biology is fundamentally different and that the genetic factors are doing something different. And it, it also suggests to us that girls that carry the genetic risk are actually showing traits. They actually are manifesting autistic features that are probably not getting picked up. So the genetics actually suggests that, uh, that most, <laughs> there is definitely probably um, traits that are just not getting diagnosed. So that's part of it. But we, there are some evidence for, uh, for sex biases and some of the genetic uh, effects. And that's, what, that's how you see this, this little yellow and blue rings around these uh, results indicate whether the genetic factor is showing a male bias or a female bias, the blue ones being male bias. So interestingly, yes, the polygenic score for autism is showing a male bias, meaning that it, it seems to be affecting social responsiveness a little bit more strongly in boys than in girls. But there are other factors that are actually female biased. So the educational attainment score is actually affecting girls more strongly than boys. So, it's, so it goes both ways. Uh, so there's really, it's not as if the male brain is simply responding more strongly to genetic factors than the female brain. It's more complex than that. And again, the, 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 the one trait that was really the most dramatic example of sex bias was parental age. So everybody knows that parental age has some association with autism risk and offspring, right? Well, these genetic factors actually have a very sex biased effect on parental age. So de novo mutations are, have a much stronger correlation with dad's age. And that's not surprising. Our group and others have known this for years and shown, shown this that, that dad, dad's age is correlated with the rates of these rare mutations in their offspring. So that's not surprising. Uh, but interestingly, there are some, some maternally biased effects. So again, the educational attainment polygenic score is really stronger, uh, more strongly associated with mom's age. So again, um, this, this, this link between genetic risk factors and mother's age and father's age is very intriguing. It's, we're starting to gain, a, get, gain an understanding of the um, of the etiology of the of the of the paternal age effect and parental age effect, and we can see that it is a very sex biased uh, thing. So the de novo mutations are on the left, and the blue the blue you can see here is the effect size of the de novo mutation. So de novo mutations correlate with dad's age, not mom's age. So if you think that increasing mom's age is going to somehow produce more mutations in your offspring, you're wrong. It's dad's age. Dad's age correlates with with mutations in offspring. Um, unless you're talking about Down syndrome or, or other types of chromosome abnormality. So it's generally dad's age is the factor for that, that risk factor. But there are other risk factors as well. Um, for example, uh, risk that's carried by the parents are actually, so the, the, the de novo mutations are associated with older fathers, but if dad actually has children earlier on average, so, so when dad actually carries the risk, um, it's actually associated with early parental age, paternal age. Um, and so that's an, another interesting genetic factor with fathers. And then, of course, the polygenic score for educational attainment is really strongly associated with mother's age. So the higher predicted educational attainment um, you have in, a, in mom, 
uh, the later she has children. So again, paternal bias of some factors and maternal bias of other factors. And now we actually are starting to get an understanding of how the genetic factors explain the parental age effect. I think we understand it fairly well now. So, so there are multiple factors that contribute to why older parents have a, a higher risk of autism and they look like so. So um, it has to do with, to some extent, the effect of, so we told, we remember how polygenic score for educational attainment is a risk factor for autism? Yes, it is. Um, and, it, and it has a, but it's actually, so if you look at the educational attainment score, it's actually the highest risk factor for parental age as well. So clearly, um, to some extent, there's, there's educational attainment seems to be a factor, but that may not be the only factor. So what if it's really not that? Maybe it's, maybe it's social responsiveness. So maybe, maybe social phenotypes in the parents might actually explain why Mo way mo mothers are older, fathers are older. So we looked at that question and asked whether the effect of the mutation on mom or dad's social behavior could explain it. And actually those go in the opposite direction. So, so actually the stronger the risk factor has, the stronger effect the risk factor has on social behavior and mothers and fathers, actually the younger they are. Um, so it's not, it's not a social trait in parents that's contributing to um, older parental age. In fact, when you carry, when you exhibit more social uh, impairments as as parents, you actually have children earlier, not later. Um, probably, it's, it's, and uh, and so this, this looks like it's not really a social deficit uh, related trait. It really probably has more to do with learn with how genetic factors contribute to learning and education in parents. So that the 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 parental age effect is to some extent linked with the level of education of their parents and the fact that. Um, that um, parents with advanced educations are more likely to have children later in life. So I'm getting close to the end, and uh, I have a few more minutes to kind of look to kind of dive into the um, biology here. Um, so first of all, we talked about the polygenic risk and the rare variants. These things actually differ in terms of what types of genes they hit and how these genes affect development of the brain. And so the, this, this different genetic spectrum um, is also related to different biology. So the rare variants, um, as you can see, are, the, are these purple uh, plots, are more enriched in expression in fetal brain. And then when you look at the timing of expression, um, they're, they're expressed earlier um, compared to other uh, risk factors for polygenic risk. So the green is the polygenic risk factor, which is expressed, uh, which are expressed prenatally um, are enriched compared to the average gene but it's really the rare mutations that are most strongly enriched in, in fetal brain, showing that, that, the, that the rare variants are really hitting on the brain genes. And if you look at this at the level of neuronal cells and figure out what, what in, where are these genes expressed in excitatory neurons, inhibitory neurons, oligodendrocytes, progenitor cells, microglia, and ask, are the, where are the autism genes being expressed? Clearly, it's not enriched in microglia. It's not enriched in, in, in radial glia. Um, the, the risk factors are strongly enriched in excitatory and inhibitory neurons and progenitor cells and, to some extent, oligodendrocytes. So the, so the, the rare variants are, are enriched in individual cell types, and it's really neurons uh, where the, the cell types are where the, the genes are strongly enriched. Interestingly, polygenic <clears throat> polygenics genes um, the common variants are not strongly enriched at a cell type level. Uh, and previously we showed that they're not really dramatically enriched in the brain compared to rare variants. So this, this is really kind of highlighting something we've learned about the genetics, which is that the rare mutations are identifying genes that play major roles in neurodevelopment. So on the top, I'm kind of giving you an example of why, why is it that the, that the rare variants are really hitting on um, genes that are very brain specific it's because these are, these are genes that have a very important role. And the reason why they carry so much risk is probably because these genes have a strong impact on development and probably a strong impact on regulatory networks. Um, the polygenic risk is much more heterogeneous. It's coming from many, many different genes of, of, of many different shapes and sizes and flavors. Uh, and while it's still, and while it's contributing a lot of risk, it's not really doing it in a very directed fashion towards a specific pathway or a specific um, in, uh, you know, cognitive process or brain region or cell type. So the, the, the polygenic risk is really coming from many different directions. 
and it's very broadly distributed across genetic networks. So to summarize, basically, um, we see this inverse correlation of genetic loadings, which is telling us that there's a genetic spectrum that to some extent underlies the phenotype spectrum. All of the genetic factors that we look at correlate with different sets of traits. So this, this genetic spectrum does explain variation in, in the autism spectrum and that gene by sex interactions occur, but they go both ways and they are not, they're not explaining um, dramatic differences in how boys respond to genetic factors versus girls. So it's really boys and girls generally respond in a similar way. And, um, and so probably ascertainment bias is probably a big factor explaining um, uh, the differences between boys and girls. Um, and then of course, the, on the, the parental age effect, we can't ignore because this is actually highlighting an important aspect of the etiology that we've learned. There are different genetic factors and they have different effects on parental age. The rare variants actually contribute to younger fathers, whereas some of the other like de novo mutations or polygenic scores for autism or educational attainment are actually associated with older mothers and older fathers. So we actually have this, uh, we actually have this U-shaped relationship of genetic factors to parental age, uh, where if you combine them together, you actually end up with this kind of an effect. So you have some factors that actually are more likely to um, have be associated with young, young fathers and some more uh, associated with older fathers. So that kind of brings me to the end. It's also consistent with previous reports that there's actually a U-shaped relationship of parental age with autism. It's not only associated with older parents, it's actually associated with younger parents. So special thanks to all the people who worked on this and, uh, and to uh, the Simons Foundation for funding this particular study I'm showing here and the NIMH. Cheers. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me just ask you the two very simple Q&As that have come up. We might as well deal with them now. One of them is, can you do a polygenic score in utero? Uh, you can, but it, 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 any, any, any geneticist who knows what they're talking about will tell you it's of zero clinical use. The genetic scores are not predictive enough to where they would strongly determine whether or not your child has autism or not, right? So if you, you can assign a polygenic score and you can pick an embryo, you could do, let's imagine we did uh, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis where we screened embryos for polygenic scores. Your high polygenic score embryo is really not gonna be, a, it's not gonna be extremely more likely than the others. Also remember, that there's a lot of other things that are going along with the polygenic score. Remember, so educational attainment, for example. If, right. you, if you chose the lowest autism polygenic score, on average, you would have kids with lower educational attainment. So we have- Independent of their, independent of their autism diagnosis. Right, so, we can go into more of this. this <laughs> so you would, you would never want to use a polygenic score for embryo selection and no geneticist would ever tell you to do right, that. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> this gets into this whole GWAS, Genome Wide Association yeah. Studies area. Uh, and the last one, are non-speaking autistic individuals included in this research? Yeah, so uh, we, so one, one of the difficulties that we have is that um, a lot of research cohorts are very biased towards the high end of the spectrum. Um, and that that's that, and, and there's actually a lot of the, the strongest genetic signal is on the low end of the spectrum. Um, and so uh, we, we really try to, to, to be, as, be as broad in our, in our recruitment as possible. But of course, we rely heavily on other studies that have recruited large samples. So we can't, um, because we rely so heavily on existing data, uh, we can't avoid this bias towards yeah. high functioning autism. Um, right. there's, a, there's a bias against the low-functioning autism, despite the fact that the low-functioning autism has very strong genetic factors. Okay, thank you, Jonathan.